Hey, this is Anthony Trucks for Identity Shift here on the Vision Lab podcast with Cuff and Mo. Welcome back to the Vision Lab podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Cuffey, alongside my co-host, Mr. Ryan Mosley. We're in partnership with Nexon Creative, and we are ecstatic in the building tonight. We've got Mr. Anthony Trucks for Identity Shift. And I tell you what, visionaries, for all of you guys that are tuning in, you are in for an absolute treat. Yo, Mo, give us some background on Anthony. Cuff, Anthony is a native of Martinez, County. California. Uh, he was a member of the Oregon Ducks from 2002 to 2006. He spent time in the NFL with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, the Washington Redskins, and the Pittsburgh Steelers. He is now the owner of Identity Shift and a renowned motivational speaker. Uh, we are happy to have you on the show, sir, and thank you for taking the time to speak with us. Hey, Absolutely. man, I, I'm here. Thank you for having me. Seriously, appreciate it. Hey, this is big, man. This is really, really big. Um, I want to jump right into it. I know that, you know, your kids are getting ready or waiting on you to play some some hoops in the background, but you're the oldest of four kids. You've got a, a really, really unique story. Um, you're the oldest of four. Mother abandoned you guys when you were little, about the yeah. age of three or four, right? Yeah, three years old. Okay. And can you, why don't you give our visionaries and paint a picture of, of what that was like and yeah. what you actually had to, to go through? Yeah, man. So uh, I'll, I'll usually stop the story when we get to like the midway because I have like two weird, uh, we'll call it two weird like valleys that I go through in life. The first one was being given away at three. So uh, I remember the whole layout of my house, my mom calling my name to the back of the apartment and we lived in Concord, which is next to Martinez at the time, border Martinez. And my mom, I come to the backyard, three years old, she gives me a kiss, she's crying, hands my hand to this one strange woman and then woman takes me off to this black crown Victoria. I'm the oldest of four, so I have little siblings, and I get in the car, and they're crying, and we drive off, and I didn't know at that moment, but essentially, my mom was giving us away into foster care, and anybody who's not experienced that, essentially, just think about the moments when you've been in life feeling like less than or lost, unsettled, unclear as to what the next moments are, and just scared of, like, I don't know what tomorrow brings. That's what I felt, you know, those first moments as a kid. Shipped off to a system that essentially I'm called a paycheck, which means as long as I don't die in these people's houses, they get paid for me. And there was no, it's 1986. We're not talking about having cell phones and cameras. There's nothing, you know, it's just, it's just, I'm in these people's houses and they check on me with social workers that half the time in a case load too big to pay attention to my name. And in these houses, man, I was, I was starved in houses. I was like forced to chase chickens to earn a meal. Uh, it was, was kind of weird. I can picture all of it even this day, man. There was one house like put me in a shopping cart, pushed me down hills towards moving traffic and then forced me to do it again. Like one house made me, they made me like lick the bottom of the neighbor kid's shoes. Like you just remember like the, the taste of like blood, kind of like metal, just weird stuff. And this is all before like six. So these are all moments in time being bounced around between like six different houses where I just had to deal with craziness. And, uh, and you never know when you're leaving. Like you legit never know if like you're going to show up this one day, your bag's packed in a plastic bag and they ship you off somewhere else. So the final house I get into, which is my family to this day, six years old, show up on the doorstep, black guy, all white family. So a little bit of a unique, you know, switch up for me. And the unique thing also is like, we're really, really poor. So we have like rats in a pantry, you know, cockroaches in the garage. Like there's just not much. My first foster dad, like this drunk used to beat my mom and beat me and like try to hide my like cuts and stuff. Like just a bad dude. And uh, man, I was in that house for, for eight years before I got adopted. And those eight years, my mom divorced that guy, remarried a guy, life got better. Still had no idea for sure I'd be there every day. So I got up every day having no idea whether or not that house is the one that I would wake up in and go to sleep in at night. And so it got scary. Like as things got better, you didn't want them to get better because then it could be taken away. But then 14, got a chance to uh, go in front of a judge in front of my real mom and look at her eyes and say, I no longer want you to be my mom anymore. Severed parental rights and got adopted. And uh, that was the first like entrance into a new space of, of my life by one knowing that I would get to go to bed in this house every day, right? Two, another problem was my mom, adoptive mom got diagnosed with MS. And then three, I got to play football, which is great because you get to hit people and I get in trouble for the first time. I like right. that. But boy, I sucked at football, man. <laughs> horrible back then. And, uh, and that was that, man. I had, I had to have this whole navigation of like, all right, what do I do? Because what happens typically is we try these new things and we suck at these new things and we have a choice. Do I continue or do I find a good excuse to tell my friends as to why I stopped? Right. And I unfortunately took the latter in the beginning. So I was like, you know what? Foster kid, 
I'm not supposed to do much in life. Like I'm not set up to do well. Statistically, if, and I found this out a couple of years ago, if you look at any prison in America, 75% of the inmates are former foster kids like me. Mm. Um, 51% of our homeless population is former foster kids and like 1% of us ever graduate college. So numerically, statistically, like I'm not supposed to do very much. I didn't know it back then. I was like, you know what? I'm just foster kid. I'm not supposed to do well. Mom's sick. Older brother's in the military. I suck at football. Chalking it up. Well, that's interesting because I was, you know, given your childhood and everything that you had to, you know, go through and and what you dealt with based off and then, you know, looking up where you are now, like, what do you attribute, you know, where your success or how you've been able to achieve so much uh, to this point? Yeah, man. Uh, (laughs) The very next moments of this story, I guess. So I I get to this point where I clock, clock out, like, you know, you just, some people clock out, they stay clocked out. I, I was lucky to be able to have a really good gift given to me in a way that wasn't expected. So I was checked out. I used to sleep in my English class, Mr. Howe's English class. We share the same birthday, actually. White dude looks like a hippie. Cool guy. And, uh, and he had this back right corner opposite his desk. I sat as far from him as I could so he wouldn't catch me sleeping. But he had this, this uh, love seat next to me. Uh, and he would let people come and sit there during class. And I remember I was like half asleep and there's two girls talking. And one girl's talking to the other girl, just ratchet. And she goes, well, well the reason I'm so bad is because I'm in foster care. And it's not, a, it's not a big deal, right? But, but the unique thing to me was I got to hear my excuse out loud and it sounded disgusting. Wow. That was the gift. It was like, because wow. sometimes we're living our life and like we'll say something to ourselves like, I'm not supposed to do that because I don't have the skill set. I don't know this. But you tell someone, your mom's like, shut up, boy. Like, you, you know, you can do that. Like, they'll, they'll shut it down but no one usually says it out loud. They just live with that and they make excuses. And so she said it and I was like, man, that feels horrible. Like, is that the reason I'm gonna be a bad dad or like, you know, just like a waste away, a loser. And I was like, I can't do it. And I remember going home and I had this mirror uh, in my, my bedroom. I'd put on the wall where I could like brush my hair back then. I used to, yeah, I said, dip it, you know, I said, wait. <laughs> <laughs> You're making and, them uh, seasick, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I remember looking like in my eyes, I looked dead in my pupils. I was like, you know what, Anthony, you're gonna be great. And I had no idea what that meant at 15 years old. But it was two things. One was like, you know, back then you had to get girls' phone numbers. Like you had to actually call and hope the dad didn't pick up the phone, you know. So I was like, <laughs> I'm going to get this girl. So I like, that was one. Other one was football. Really, I spent time in football. And so I was like, I got to find out what it is that I got to do to be able to be the great football player. Because I'm not that right now. I, I, I want to know what they do. Like, how do they work? What, what happens? So I just, I started doing things that athletes do, but not really having the confidence to do it. I had, I had no belief inside or reason to do that kind of work. I started grinding though, man. I would just do push-ups and I would throw footballs in the air, hit the weights, run routes. And after a whole off season of doing this, I came back a monster. Like, does mean. <laughs> I was just, this dude, like, you know, like the little weird kid who's like, like halfway not there. Like you just, when you, when you hit him, like and he gets back up and keeps going. Like that was, yeah. that was who I was. And like, I would not stop because in my head, you didn't have the right to beat me today. Like I did all this work. Like you, you don't have I, all the reps, all the ca- like. No, no, no. I, I'm not letting that guy get let down by this guy today. And so I had this this shift internally of like who I was going to be and how I showed up. And so when you ask the question of how does that lead in, here's the unique thing that I teach now. Like you've heard parts of my identity, and there's more that goes into this story. But I had to go through all these different shifts. And what I found was in those moments, I did this thing that few people grasp that they're typically doing because they run away from the situation and don't reenter it. But what you create creates you. Yeah. I had created this, this stronger, faster, more in shape, more skilled body. And in doing the physical work, I created the internal guy, the guy that had his chip on his shoulder. And that's so interesting because, you know, our podcast really is about mindset and, and everyone talks about it. I mean, you know, we've, you, you read books by Carol Dweck talking about growth right mindset. There versus a, a fixed mindset, right? Yeah. But, you know, you go a layer deeper, right? Mm-hmm. What, um, why did you decide to look at mindset as the first level and then going into, you know, a, an ultimately shift, an identity yeah. shift? Well, you know, it's not that I, I chose to, but I think God puts things on you. And actually, the, the, as you get to the back end of the story, you'll realize why, like, probably three years ago, this came to be that extra tier. You know, it, a lot of people read that book, The Secret, and it's like they get this dialed in mindset. I can do this and I can be amazing, but then they still are broke, but they got a great right. mindset, you know? Right. And there's, there's times when I came out of the NFL and like I was, I had a great mindset. I played the NFL, great mindset, broke, almost bankrupt, lost my marriage, like craziness. 
and what it is 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 I've come to find in my work that mindset is one of the six like foundational pieces of what creates your identity. And if you think about a brief like picture of Venn diagram, three circles overlapping. On one top tier, you have the beliefs. On the bottom right tier, you can go ahead and put the thoughts, and then across there, you can put actions. Those three. So it's a set of beliefs, thoughts, and actions that run us. What are my beliefs? What am I thinking throughout the day? What are the actions that I'm taking? But the overlaps are where it happens to be powerful. So between my beliefs and my thoughts, if I believe I'm powerful and strong, my thoughts are always chopping myself down. You should be this, this, and this. Yeah, but you suck. You don't have the skill set. You don't know anybody. You're not very good. My mindset gets really, really weak because I can't show up in those moments and fight for myself when I need to. Or you have where actions and thoughts overlap. There's actions I should take. And I tell myself and I think about doing them, but then I don't. My habits fall short. I don't take the action consistently. I don't get the result I'm looking for. Then you have the one that's really big, the one that I built and realized through all this stuff that came to be, it's beliefs and actions. If I believe I'm supposed to do something and I do it, I feel good. I feel proud. Like I got the workout in. If I believe I'm supposed to get up and get that workout in, but then I don't, I feel, oh man, I suck a little bit. Like, oh man, why didn't you get that workout in, right? And you start, you start chipping away at this, this sense of self and this character and pride. And so that overlap that you have between beliefs and actions, when you do the action, you follow suit and actually you have this chip that builds and builds. And so now I have the character, I have the mindset, I have the habits, and it rolls in the center of that whole Venn diagram, what's called your ideal identity. This is something you can actually architect and create, but that's essentially where mindset, everything flows together. And they're all heavily important pieces. There's not one stronger than the other one, but without one, the rest of them fall short. Yeah. yeah. They all work in concert with each other. Would you agree? Simultaneously, man. It's like a symphony. So, at what point, you know, like you said, you, you, you become a monster in a summer, essentially, once you really dedicate yourself to football. And mm-hmm. then you look up and you're a foster kid and you find yourself going to the University of Oregon. Yeah. What type world. of, I'm going to say, what type of, because uh, I'm, I'm imagining uh, uh, Eugene is different than, than Martinez, California. <laughs> a little bit. Um, what type of identity change or, or, or shift, if you will, did you go through in your time at Oregon? Yeah, so many, man. So just going up there is one, because now I'm, you know, I've gone through the the foster kid, the adopted kid, the the black kid, you know, in an all white family, the athlete. Like I've got all these things that are part of who I am building up, and then I get to Oregon and a couple things disappear, right? So I had my high school sweetheart I was with, so now like I don't have that, uh, I don't have the family base because my mom and dad they're back home. I don't have that solidarity. I also go from being the big man on campus to like who's this little plebe around here running around? Go get, go get my shoulder pads, you know, like different environment. So I have to navigate this, like, how do I give energy to this thing that I need to give energy to with full power when emotionally I feel like giving nothing. I want to tuck away in a corner and like eat sugary and salty food. You know, like that's just, we naturally do. Everybody gets to those points, but you just fight it and you fight it. And so I go through that one. Then uh, my sophomore year, my, my high school sweetheart moved up with me. Right. So I, I, Proposed to her at 18 years old. Don't do this. It's, it's, it worked out for me, but I don't recommend people do this at 18. Like, you got a lot of life to live, my man. So, proposed to her about maybe nine months later. The, uh, we find out we're pregnant. So, now I'm, you know, I'm going to be a sophomore in college with a kid. I find my biological dad that I didn't even know existed anywhere in the world. His name wasn't on my birth certificate. My mom never told me his name. My real grandma somehow found me. And, uh, and then I, I tried to get his name and then got his name. Found out he lived in Marietta, Georgia. My true sophomore year, I was fighting for a spot uh, as a redshirt uh, against a redshirt senior. So he's five years in, my second year, and uh, and I won the job. And so my real dad drove from Marietta, Georgia, to our first game, which was at Mississippi State. So my first start, national television. I got this game ball right here, and I met mm. my real dad on the same day. So crazy, like culmination of like, all right, now I'm the guy that has all this stuff and a kid student athlete i got two dads but they're not gay i just got two dads uh i gotta, I gotta move on and then i got a lot i mean I, I at the same time i have to deal with you know stuff at home where my grandparents takes his life like just weird stuff and uh and then you get to the end of it and you're like all right i have this family like i went into college as a boy and i left as a man with a kid going to the nfl so like lots of Lots of weird, uh, they call them, what they call those event horizons that took place in college, right? Sure, right? Whole different world coming out of there. Why number 84? <laughs> okay, I have seriously. the same question. Hey, so when I was in, when I was in uh, football years before, like youth football, we're number 11. I was horrible. Uh, my freshman year, I wore like number 80 something, just like 81. Horrible. Then I started wearing even numbers, and it was, I was great. I have, so I have this phobia of wearing odd numbers. 
So I get to college and they had like number 30 something, one, whatever it was. I'm like, they had no even numbers except for 84. So I was like, all right, I'm where 84 is a linebacker. And like, no, you're not. I'm like, yeah, I am. (laughs) I've never seen a linebacker wear 84. You're welcome. That's crazy. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, I've been a big fan of yours for a while now. And you talk a lot about in terms of, you know, an identity shift. You talk about how we need to reprogram our mindset, um, how we're still working with um, outdated software. And yeah. that we need to update our software. And it, it's mm-hmm. something that, you know, when I heard that for the first time, I was like, you know what? Yeah, when was the last time that we I had a software upgrade from a cognitive perspective? Yeah, purposely. You know? It's it's a I mean it, it's so you want me to tell you the concept of it and break it down. Yeah, and absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah, I got you. Do. So so any of us that have computers know there's always those moments in time when that little that little thing comes up in the corner and says, Hey, you want to stop what you're doing and then restart this computer and update software for like the next hour? I'm like, no. <laughs> No, no. I won't do that, right? So I click it away and I keep doing my Remind thing. me later. Yeah, 24 hours. Give me an hour. Try it tonight, you know, and then it just keeps popping up. And I'm like, ah, oh, because I don't want to wait for that thing to update. What ends up happening is we don't, we don't update it. Then all of a sudden, like, the program start bogging down and you start opening up Word, Microsoft Word. It starts crashing. You lose everything you're writing. You can't seem to get your emails to work. It's like you start getting to this point where it's just all messed up. Then you get that spinning wheel of death, which is taking forever for something to load. And then eventually, like, right, the computer starts messing up. You got to open in safe mode because all the software programs aren't going to work the same. Open in safe mode. Let me go ahead and get this thing figured out. And eventually, like, damn it, I just got to update this thing. Click the button, sit back and wait painfully while this thing goes and updates. And then it comes back and it runs smooth. So in life, a lot of us don't realize that it's very similar for us as human beings living in this physical hardware that wakes up every day, a brand new body for the most part, like it's for the most part healthy but operating off of software that's like, you know, Windows 95, like way yeah. back in the day. Yeah. Like, you know, I haven't got out of the stuff that happened in my childhood or, you know, school. Somebody told me I'm a loser and the teacher didn't, you know, said I couldn't read and all these things that end up happening that we're, we're operating off that, that software. And so what happens throughout life, we're getting the updates. People are saying, hey, you should stop being so mean. You should stop, you know, start being more open. You should work a little bit harder. These updates, we say, no, 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 snooze that. I want to deal with that. I'm not going to take it. So what happens is, over time, the programs, which is relationships, our health, our careers, our finances, our wherewithal, self-confidence, these programs start slowing down. Eventually, I don't have control. They, they start, I start losing relationships. I start getting out of shape. My, my money ain't right. Like, so I start having these things happen. And then all of a sudden, like, I do got to operate sometimes in safe mode, right? Which means cutting people off and trying to get siloed in and do my thing. But you find like, no, I need these people. I do need money. I need this job. And eventually, you have to stop, pull yourself back hit the damn update and take the time, like a computer, take the painful time to start figuring out like, why in the world does everybody keep saying the same thing? Why am I here? Why am I broke? Why am I unhappy? Why am I out of shape? Why, why can't I make money? Why can't I get the promotion? And you ask those questions, you actually find that you get the answers. But if you don't seek it or give yourself permission to go find it, you consistently keep running into the position of having that spinning wheel of death in your life and trying to operate in safe mode. So a lot of my work is going in and teaching people how to update. And I'm, you know what? I'm curious, Cuff. Anthony, you 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 kind of laid that out, and you're right in regards to the, like the, the software update cognitively, right? Mm-hmm. When was the first? You've been through a lot, obviously. We're not even, you know, we're we're barely halfway home. But when did you find yourself in an environment that was conducive to you actually being able to go through the software update? Because yeah. you know, you go from being a foster kid, and you're in, you know, a major division one program at Oregon, then you're in the NFL and that, that is a true dog eat dog world. Yeah. When, when did you find yourself in a place where it's like, okay, it's actually safe for me to go through my software update? Well, it was not, it wasn't, it wasn't like it was a joyous moment. I usually you don't you have a choice that like you hit that rock bottom. That's the problem is we, we take it so far because we can operate for a certain level to a certain place. And really like you're kind of getting updates throughout. Like someone tells you to stop doing this and you get better reluctantly in little areas. But then what happens is all of a sudden your life will outpace you. And, and when life outpaces you and desires more responsibilities are higher, if you aren't prepared to handle that, that bandwidth, you know, your processor can't handle all that, your computer crashes. And, and so for me, yeah, it came to a head when I really had to make one, when I kind of pushed a little bit past, it was like three years out of the league, is I come home. Uh, I tore my shoulder playing against the Philadelphia Eagles when I put the Pittsburgh Steelers. NFL has its own little weird stories, but it stands for not for long. You're in, you're out, like NFL. 
and uh, and really just a matter of me trying to fight as a guy from you know the, one of the young guys, or, you know, free rage and trying to figure out where my world fits. And I got this point where I was finally in, torn my shoulder, come home. So now I have to realize, all right, that part of who I was is gone. Major identity crisis. You know, hell am I without football? Big problem. Then I have my wife, and we have two more kids. And then I also want to find a way to get back my, my sense of self. Like, who's in? I want to get my, you know, puff my chest up again. I'm going to open this gym business. I'm going to be amazing, right? So I get into this. Nine months in, like I'm there, nine, 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. I'm not even at the house. We have two more kids. And next day, I'm like, I'm struggling. Like nine months and I can't actually pay the rent. The landlord serves with eviction notice. You got, wow. you got two weeks to pay 16 racks or you have to get out. I had like 4,000 in my name at this point. I had to figure a way out of that hole. So... What ends up, and we did. We I, I spent the last money on a coach. I had like had a six thousand dollar coach. I had four grand a game. I was like, I need you to. I'm gonna give you four. When we make the rest, I'll pay you back. We'll figure it out. And he did. He was great. He got me to the point of four months later, we had quadrupled the income. Like I, I and that was kind of the first precipice of like, oh, I got to get better. That was one of the first upgrades. Uh, that was just a business one. I still hadn't figured out the home one. So next thing I know, like I'm I'm a couple years past. And I'm trying to navigate this business thing. My wife and I are at head. She's, you know, hanging out, doing a whole lot. We got the kids and I'm never home. And what ends up happening is we go on this trip to, to Hawaii. And I find on Hawaii, my wife's texting some dude and I find out she's having an affair. So wow. like now I got like this other part of like, damn, man, how am I supposed to like look my friends, people, friend in the face? I can't even keep my wife at home. You know, it's like, damn. So then now I'm dealing with the business is never perfect, but we figured out some things. Like it was still up and down every two weeks when I pay payroll and rent. I have no marriage. I've, I've subjected my kids and my head to a, a distant father because now my marriage falls apart and we're getting divorced. I'm out of shape because I'm not even, you know, I'm at the gym stressed out all day. And what made me, me is gone. So everything that was Anthony was gone. And I was in a fog for like three, four months. And I remember going to a UFC fight. My, one of my buddies, Derek, had a UFC fight. And I go to the fight and I'm sitting in the corner. And I didn't notice, but for three hours, I sat there, didn't talk to anybody, didn't say a word, just, just stared at the screen. And then when it was done, I got up and walked out. My best friend, Jay, walks in behind. He's like, hey, man, I, I know you, and this is not you. He's like, I need you to realize that you've been, you know, kind of off. He's like, this is your reality. Boom. And I don't know what it was, but, like, it just, everything hit. Like, like someone drove a truck into my chest. And I get in the car, and I remember, like, just tears, like, shooting out of my face. And I couldn't stop crying. I couldn't breathe. It was like this thing where, and I found later that your brain sometimes can't, differentiate between physical and emotional like pain so I had this pain that was so abrasive in the moment I was like I can't I couldn't stop it so I sent a text to my friends and family I said please tell my kids who their father was drove off like 10 o'clock at night looking for some rat poison just off like off the rocker dude head was gone and if you drove far enough there was no stores open thankfully drove like an hour to like a town called Stockton and I'm sitting there and I'm just kind of like the waves started disappearing and then police had tracked my phone by GPS they pull up and you know, you're all right, they're checking me out. I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. Played it off. You know, like, I'm good. My wife's crazy. She's tripping. She called the cops and every, obviously everybody's looking for me. And then I go home and uh, I, go, I pull to my house, man. There's like 30 people outside all been looking for me. One of the most shameful experiences. Like, that's not me, but it's like, damn, like this is my rock bottom. And, and for a lot of people, they have these moments. It's what I call an identity gap. There's such a huge gap between the person I am and the person that I desire to be that it's just this widening gap and there's no way to close it. And there's a rock bottom and I fell into it. And then I had one seed planted. That was a seed that leads to the answer your true question of how I, I got out of this program. But one of my buddies a couple of days later was like, Hey man, I have to tell you, uh, I felt like whatever with was going on, I said, I felt like I lost a hero. I threw up in the toilet. Like, this guy I played high school football with a buddy of mine. I'm like, what do you mean lost a hero? He said, really at the end of the day, you've lived a great life. You're an inspiration to a lot of people. Uh, he says, just nobody tells you, but you're an inspiration to us, man. And it was the first time I heard that I was actually in living my life, doing something that benefited other people. It was like, it was just something that was benefiting people in a different way that I never thought possible. So I was like, man, what if I tried to do that proactively? But I was in no place to teach anybody anything. I was like, I'll just leave that seed there, keep doing the gym thing. And for a couple of years did that, man, custody battles with my wife back and forth with all the kids and not so stuff business was struggling I was living in a 500 square foot studio apartment putting my kids all three of them on like an air mattress like dude not living the dream post football good mindset not doing very well you know <laughs> so that's where I talk about like I had to figure this thing out and then I remember I woke up one day on New Year's living the bachelor life thinking it was great and it wasn't 
And I remember I was next to this woman who had flown out from Russia, I didn't even speak English. And it was just like this moment I woke up and I was like this, if my son saw me, I'd feel disgusted in me. If my, if my kids saw me and I saw them do this, I'd be disgusted in them. I was like, this is, I can't do this. And unfortunately at the same time, my, uh, like around this window, my mom passed away in uh, 2014, like April 15, 2014, I was in the room holding her hand and it was the first moment that the seed uh, kind of took root and started getting watered. And the simple thought I had was, man, this is life. And my mom's potential was wasted. Like she's so joyous and, and buoyant and just amazing, like bright woman. But then like her life was taken. She could not fulfill potential. And I'm over here living this life that I'm not even in love with. It just I feel bad about. And at the same time, I was like, what can I do to like pass her memory on? Because statistically, she's why I'm not doing craziness. I was like, what if I just take the thought that my buddy Richie gave me, my mom's unconditional love to love on me in a way that was really not necessary for her. I was a bad little kid, like bad little kid. I was like, what if I give that to the world through some, I don't know, you know, framing of what I've got going on. And so I started pushing out. And what I did is I stopped everything, tucked myself away from the world. I sat in my townhouse on my brown couch, looked at this brown wall. And I literally just started asking the questions. Why in the hell is this your life right now? Why are you broke all the time? Why is your is all relationships and you know females you're with? Why is it off? Um, you know why aren't you being a good dad? Or what what's going on with your health? Like this, all these questions, and I would legit dig into the answers. And I would do a lot of work, read a lot of books, had a lot of conversations. Man, I had, I had a conversation with the guy that slept with my wife. Like had you know kind of I don't want to swash it, but like have that conversation to where I had no enemies, and it had I had to find peace and clarity through a lot of it had to find my part in the whole situation, like even with hers, like her, her situation, she made a crappy choice. And we talk about now, she made a crappy choice. However, she didn't get to a place of having to make a choice by herself. Tough pill to swallow. Like yeah. she should have done that. But she, if I was a president at home, that might never have been in a position to even need to do that. So was I perfect? No. Was she perfect? No. But I had a role of a small, but like having these accepting pieces gave me a chance to like, okay, I can work on that. I can update that. So let me start working and digging and grinding and growing and speaking and talking. And so it turned into something where in one weird precipice of a moment, I get to, it was like June, 2014, uh, which was like after my mom had passed away, after these things had started happening, I got this big quarter million dollar contract to do a health and wellness program for a PG and um, company nearby, a power company. And uh, it was like $220,000 of profit. So I'm like, I was maybe making like 50 grand a year at the time. So I'm like, I could live like four years off this uh my mom passed away and i was like i want to branch out to the world tell my story the gym the lease was up so i was like i don't even have to re-up the lease i could sell my equipment get a little bit of money out of that and then i happened across a guy named brennan Burchard, who's in like the personal development world who happened to do this thing called experts academy that teaches you how to be able to take your story and craft it in a way that helps benefit the world so for me it was like god opened this big door it's like hey end the gym I'm pass right. your mom's message on Here's some money to get going. Here's how to do it. And that was why I pushed it in the next year. So, and that was a like super incredible story. And, and I love how authentic it is, right? Like that's what people are dealing with on a daily basis. You know, spouses could be cheating on them, um, not mm -hmm. doing well financially. You know, you're, you're out trying to, you're lost and trying to figure it out. And we need that, that, that upgrade. And, and you talked about having um, the identity gap. You know who yeah. you want to be. You know that there's a gap that exists between who you want to be and who you currently are. Right now, we're dealing with, you know, the coronavirus. Yeah. What are your thoughts on you, you leveraging this time period to really tap into yourself and figure out and have that moment where you were sitting, you know, at home looking at a, a brown wall or what have yeah. you? Yeah, well, I mean, what's funny is you'll always find that, that the gap shows up in, in spots where if you finally look for it, you'll understand what you have to do to close the gap. So for me, the aspiration that I have for people is like my mom couldn't do is like help people reach full potential. And it's usually something that you can't even see. Like usually what people see is their 10, they reach their 10, they're like, oh, that was a two. Damn, I could do so much more. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's like, I'm always looking to help people close these gaps, especially nowadays, what you're finding is with this exact moment we're in, people are being introduced to their gaps, their fear, their, their anguish, their pain, their lack of preparedness, like their, their you know, anxiety. These things are be able to be shown. And what happens is in our world, people like to lean on the wrong legs of a tripod. And what I mean by that is I look at life like a tripod where the top of the sea is like a camera for a real tripod, but the top of the sea in life is what you create. 
and the legs that hold up what you create, your health, your wealth, your relationships, your, your everything, there's tools, techniques, and technicians. And most people spend a lot of time on tools and techniques. Let me get a strategy to fix this, read this book, do all these things. Let me buy this new tool. I'm going to go buy this software and this program and this thing and this camera, whatever it is. But few people go back and say, well, why is it that even with these tools and techniques and investing in these programs, why am I still falling short? Why is the guy next to me doing it and I can't seem to do it? And, and what it is, it's like they haven't yet closed that gap. So they're the person on one end trying to do what that other person does. And it gets overwhelming. It's difficult to do those steps and show up and make the calls and like, it's just difficult. So they never consistently do it. Whereas this person over here, that's just their typical Tuesday. They get that done. You know, let's keep on moving, right? And so what happens because too many people are focused on the tools and techniques. And when you step back and say, well, how do the tool and techniques come to be? Because they do work. Some strategies will help you make more money, will help you be in better shape. You could have a band set up at the house. You can have, you know, a whole gym. But you, can, you may be a person with an amazing gym. This person's got a dumbbell and they're yoked out. How is that? Right. Is that a different strategy? But they're the person that shows up every day. And what it is, is you can step back and say, well, the technician has to be in a position where they realize that the tools and techniques were created by the right technician. Somebody that went out and, and figured out what the problem was and solved the problem and then created that thing. And like, here's your new tool. Here's your strategy. I figured it out. I'm gonna come back and teach you. And when you step back and say, oh, if I'm the right technician, not only can I make my own tools and techniques, but I'll utilize these better. And then I can actually not have to worry about what I have and what it is. And so I operate as this person now who's closed the gap. And that person has everything that I want. Because if you are to this person, you have those things. If you are to the person that, that made the right calls and did the right you know, effort and energy and put time and made the investments, took the risk, you'd have the things this person has, but you're still stuck on the other side of the gap because you haven't figured out what to do to close that gap. And a lot of it boils down to sheer actions, man. Like if I could boil it down, it's the actions, the chip, it's everything I talked about earlier. And that being able to shift those small things by having a foundational core of planning as to what will shift those things, you shift the one to shift them all, and then you start closing the gap. Who was the first technician you met upon discovering all of this? Yeah, yeah. There are a lot of technicians in different levels, man. There's, uh, I mean, it's sports. It was guys I was around, like when I was in football, and you're talking about, you know, guys like the Ben Roethlisberger's and, uh, you know, Arnold Harrison and James Harrison, uh, a lot of different dudes, right? Football. But then in this business realm, I'm always exposed to people who are technicians. For me, it was literally uh, in the fitness space, a guy named Todd Durkin. Todd Durkin's this guy that I liked how his mind used to work. Like he was, the way he got tied in with Under Armour, he's the head of performance for Under Armour. Like he like saw Kevin Plank at a game, started a conversation, you know, super out of the way. Like anybody else could have been standing there, but not everybody was of the identity to start talking to this dude, you know? So you start to see like how his mind works. Uh, then you got people who start telling you like, hey, I, I needed good food. One guy was like, I need to tuck myself away, write this book, but I wanted to have healthy food, but I didn't want to make the food. So how do I do this? He's like, I went to one of the local schools at a culinary school or culinary program. I talked to the, the teacher to talk to the students and I got one of the students to be able to, to, you know, pretty much buy into like, I'll buy the food, you cook the food, we both eat. So I can take care of food and I'm just buying food, but I get a free, you know, and it's like these little ways that these people work. It's like, that's the, the match behind the scenes that you don't see that separates them. And it turns into what I call like that Midas touch. Like there's certain people, I don't know why, it just everything they touch, it wins. Like, why is this person, go, 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 yeah. why do you always win, right? And, and what I found is, it's kind of like it, it, it's success is their second nature now. The, like I talked about the things, here's a good way. Your brain actually is from neuroscience inside. You know, it'll show you that you have like a decision fatigue tank. So when you wake up in the morning, there are certain choices that you have to make. And when you make these choices, it fatigues your decision. That's why like Steve Jobs wears the, the turtlenecks every time. Like that's all he had to worry about. Even like Obama had like one or two suits. There's not many choices. They got way too many decisions to make. I don't got to think about which suits and socks I'm wearing. It's not worth my time today. And so what you see is like they do it because of fatigues. So certain people, they get up in the morning and they're like, man, should I catch that workout? Do I do, I do these emails? Do I make this call? Do I, do I you know, reach out to Ant to schedule this podcast? Should I make this content? Do I make this video? Do I, do I, do I? So by two o'clock, like your decision tank is gone. Done mm. for. Wow. But certain people get up and they say, I'm the guy that writes the, the emails, does the podcast, records that, makes those calls. That's who I am. My ego, that's who I, I built that, I created, that's who I am as an identity. That's why it's my typical Tuesday. That's what I do on Tuesday, right? I get this done. So by two o'clock, I still got 80% of the tank left. So I roll. 
And this is where people make like success becomes second nature because of the way they operate. That's like when people say, hey, what do you really do? I teach people how to elevate how they operate in that sense. So I start ex exposing people to things that stretch their actions, stretch their beliefs, their minds, their thoughts, so I can put them in positions to create. So it creates that sense of self. And now the things that overwhelm them become easy. Like it's what I do on Monday morning. You so overwhelm me. That's my Monday morning. And now you do the next step and the next step and it builds. So you kind of touched on this right now. Um, why don't you talk about your, the 80, 20 principle? Yeah. Well, 80, 20 is like Pareto principle, like uh, the 80% of what you do. So I mean, it's, it's one of those things. It wasn't my principle and I haven't made that. Um, but essentially it's like 80% of what you do will account for 20% of like your, your benefits, you know, or whatever it may be. And I'm sorry, 20% of what you do will, will account for 80% of your benefits. Uh, and then you have the reverse of it, right? So 80, they say 80% of your problems come from 20% of your people you work with. <laughs> it's like just the reverse of it all. But essentially it's like, if you, if you know what that 20% is and you do that, well, you'll kill it. But a lot of people that 20% is the hardest 20%. It's the, it's the most difficult 20%. And really it's outside of what is our typical, they call it comfort zone. It's outside of our homeostasis. Homeostasis is like the level of comfort of what we do with our habits, our thoughts. It's like when if you don't have to think, it's just, you, you just, you do things. There's actions and reactions in your brain. Essentially, it in fact has what's called your default mode network, your DMN. And if, if I was to ask you, who are you? A part of your brain shuts down, but that's the same thing that if I was to let you daydream about who you are, what you do, your likes, that part lights up. So when you think about it, it's odd. It shuts down and goes to the conscious. Oh, I'm the guy that has this card. I did this thing. And I was you start listing off your, your things that, that you've accomplished. Whereas if you ask who you are, um, in a sense, like, daydreaming is when it pulls up so oddly you are who you are when you're not thinking about who you are so at homeostasis when i'm not thinking i'm just operating throughout my day things just happen i i see things i perceive things i react i act i just da, 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 do my thing at the end of the day i go to sleep and that that process created something and what happens is when i do the work i do i'm trying to make this process up here operational to where the same level of emotional output it just does things and it's just my operation, but the output is way higher. You have sure. more impact, you make more money, right? But this right here is like pulling teeth, like to, to go here, because I'm making you stretch out of what's comfortable to you. There's a book called The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg, and he talks about like if there's calm families, when things get hectic, they all shut down till it calms down. A chaotic family, if, if things go to the point of like being calm, they freak, somebody's messing up. Susan's over here kicking the, the dog and something goes crazy <laughs> again, you know? So we as humans have the same thing. And, and my goal is to get to where the same feeling you have of life emotionally, expenditure wise, and just like, you know, frustration down here, it's the exact same, but it's way up here. And that takes a lot of push to kind of get up that level. And a lot of it's that 20% of actions. What are the things I'm doing that I'm not doing consistently that when I start doing those things like normal and natural, it kills it. Like simple thing is like I always look at my schedule and I'm like, oh, I'm busy. And then I'm like, what if I, like, what if P. Diddy pulled out his, his calendar and showed it to me? What if P. Diddy looked at my schedule? What do you be like? Oh, bro, that's, that's, that's tough. What do you be like? Bro, shut up. <laughs> go to work. You know what I mean? Right. So right. I, I balance in my own head. I'm like, yeah, what I want, even for Anthony, has got to be stretched. Like I got to keep stretching and building. And I just consistently stretch and build and keep going here myself. It's not easy, man. But that's how we level up. Sure, for sure. So, wow. go ahead, Mo. Go I was just curious. You know, you do a lot of training classes and and coaching classes and things like that. Do you travel at all? A lot, man. I, I give speeches, man. I'm on the stage in front of like two, three thousand people at a time, typically. All right now, when's the next time you're going to be in uh, the Dallas Fort Worth area? Uh, if everything goes according to plan, I should be down there June 5th for a speech, uh, at, what's it, is there like an island, some island down there? It's probably like, eight, not even near Dallas, Fort Worth. Sweetwater Island or something? Does that sound familiar? In not Texas, if there's or? an island. Yeah, there's, there's some island on the edge of Texas and like the Gulf, but I'll be in Dallas, Fort Worth. I, I'm launching a show called The Truck Talks, where I go on a flatbed of a truck and hang out with people in this chat. So I'm going to be interviewing, um, John Haggerty and Trent Shelton down there. That'll be, I'll be there June 6th third and fourth for sure down there recording that thing describe to us um c shift sh sustain c man that's the work that's so that is where everything i just talked about becomes actionable that's the thing where people are like sounds good aunt well how do i do all of that because that yeah. really at the end of the day it's like how do you so great question actually uh so at the end of the day everything i talked about is conceptual the concept makes sense 
But Anthony, what the hell do I do with that? That's like if somebody says, I want to get in better shape. Oh, you got to eat better, lift some weights. Like, all right, what exactly do I got to do? So there's three levels that I, I, I go through. This is the full companies. Like this is how I break everything down, take everybody through this from my Amazon executives to Amazon corporation. I go train them uh, all the way down to like, you know, Susan from Chicago. Like these are literally the same steps. And what happens is you have three tiers, C, shift, sustain. The shift is the work. And a lot of people will do the work. The problem is they'll do the work that they feel comfortable doing that, that I like to do in the morning, but that's not the stuff that moves the needle. It's a lot, a lot of people will put a lot of work in, buy the tools and techniques, invest the money and put the time and stuff, but then they get to the point of like huffing and puffing, climbing this ladder to the top of the building, get up there and go, oh wait, the ladder's leaned against the wrong building. I didn't do the right work. So I always have the prerequisite is what's called the C stage. The C stage is what I had to do when I sat against the wall and just stared there and be like, what in the world is going on in my life? The C state is where you go through a very specific process for yourself and involve other people around you to figure out what are the things that you do not see about yourself that are holding you back. What's the invisible you know, anchor? What's the invisible shackle on your ankle you can't seem to move yourself past? Um, where do you need to do the work? And then also, a lot of people don't dream at full speed. Yeah. Imagine you're driving down this road like a nice open desert, nice drop top Ferrari hitting full speed like that, the heart pumping like, ah, excitement, right? That's what happens when we have these amazing dreams. But then what happens is you start saying, oh, but I don't know if I have time or money or I don't know if anybody's going to support me. What if, they, what if they say something negative? And we start putting speed bumps in the road. It's the same as if I'm driving the, like, down the road too far. I got to like slow down, go over the speed bump. So I can't get moving at full speed. So a lot of what I do is once I've removed these things that have been holding me back, you finally own and accept and see. Now I'm like, hey, where do you want to go without speed bumps? Let's take out the stuff of resources. Take out the stuff of, I don't know anybody. I don't have skill sets. Where do you really want to go? And now that I can get you dreaming at full speed, now we do the shift work. We know what the work's supposed to be. We put the ladder against the right building and it takes time. And there's a process we go through here. We talked about before, what you create creates you. It's four stages. I literally design and architect my ideal identity. I then develop a plan of action around what's going to take place to make this thing work. I deploy the action out into the world, and then I come back and I debrief. A lot of people will go out and do all these things and try something new, and they go and they're like, oh, wait, I suck. Like when I did football, oh, I suck at this. I don't want to do that again. Like I don't want to re-expose myself to something that shows me how bad I am at this thing. And so nobody ever does. They go back to it. But if they do go back, it's like three to six months later. I forgot everything that was the, the juicy goodness at the moment that could have been beneficial. So I debrief now. Hey, why didn't this work? Okay, cool. We got the information. Let's go back and redesign, redevelop, redeploy, debrief. And we keep going. It's a process. And it usually takes like around like three to four months. But after I go through, this person has been resubjected themselves to something that was difficult, but they have a new skill every time, new information every time. So if it was a 10 of pain at first, it's a nine, then an eight, then a seven, then a six, all the way back down to zero. But at zero, it's not like, oh, this is easy, no big deal. It's actually joy. Like for you guys, when you started the podcast, I'm sure at first you're like, hey, you want to record this? Like, all right, let's get recording. First of all, let's go, you know? Yeah. After a while, well, see, it's funny you said that, though. We planned for like six months because <laughs> I've got a background. i got a background in this whole, you know, communication world. And yeah. I thought, you know, we, we sat up one night for like four hours, smoking cigars, just putting, you know, poking holes and everything that we, you know, we put on paper, like, okay, what are we missing here? Why, why can't, why, why, why will this not work? And so we yeah. tried to like, you know, eliminate all the things that would work against us and whatnot. And even after that night, we planned for like another six months before we actually put out an episode and we're not even a year in yet. We're talking to people like you. So I think we okay. did something right. You did. Well, you did something wrong. You could have been right faster. That's all I'll tell you. true, but then, we, but then we wouldn't have the knowledge that we have now, though, right? Very true. Very true. And that, the thing is, nothing's ever wrong. I'm just like, in my head, like, if I was working with you, I'd be like, hey, the first moment you're like, I want to do this, I will nudge you to make it happen now. Because the faster I can get you to get to the point of debrief, the faster you can learn to reapply. That's the beauty. And now you're like six months in, there's joy. Like, oh, look at me, I'm good. I got these. I'm having fun with this. I get to ask cool questions. At first, it's a little bit scary, but then we get to the point of like, now it's joyful. I enjoy doing this. And when we get people to that point, like, I bet you can't sit here and tell me, like, a hey, episode, you know, podcast 25, all of a sudden it turned on. Like, looking back, you're like, I don't know where, but at one point I'm like, man, we're good. Like, we got this. Yeah, it yeah. just happened. And it happens over that time of debrief, redevelop, and keep putting it out. And the last part of it, sustain, 
And for me, I hate when people have success and then they, they slip back the old way of thinking or the old identity. They go back and widen the gap again. And for me, it's always having a process in place to drive, hive, and thrive. Like what is keeping me driven? Am I going in the right direction so I don't make a U-turn? How do I make sure I'm going the right direction? What's the hive I need around me? The collection of people? Because every, every level creates a new devil. And so as you create new devils, new, new problems with new successes, you got to have a group of people around you that stretch you to go to the next tier in ways you don't quite see. And the last part's when I'm thriving. Thriving for me, I'm doing so well, I want to give back. And it introduces me to a new thing that I want to do. And the wheel starts again. Where do I have to go and see the problem that I have that doesn't allow me to thrive at the level I want? And it's actually a wheel. And so that, that's what sea shift sustain is. And that's what we work people through in different ways. Absolutely amazing. So I, I, I know we're a little bit limited on time. I've got a couple more questions for you. Um, yeah, one you. in particular was um, you talked about six levels of failure. Yeah, yeah. And so talk, I, I didn't quite understand that. Why don't you talk to me and the visionaries that are, that are tuning in? Of course. Uh, what the six levels of failure are. Yeah. So in life, we always have these moments that give us great gold if we don't, uh, if we don't shut them down too early. So a lot of people that go in, they'll deploy and they fail, which is what happens. We always have the failures along the road and we know they're going to happen. But the problem is we don't sift it through the right filter. And what ends up happening is we fall short. It's why we don't debrief and go back and redesign. So what happens is six levels. The top level is abject, which is like end of the world, can't fix it, never coming back from this. Below that, you have what's called structural failure. Like it's, the, it's a humongous piece of it broke. It can be fixed, but it's going to be way too hard to fix. And, but I don't know if I fix it, I walk away from it typically. This was my marriage, right? Structural failure, affair, we're out of here. And then you have glorious, which is like, all right, this thing ain't being fixed. I'm going to smoke a stogie and watch it burn. Like it, I'm not going to take anything from this. Those top three usually aren't very helpful. If it's abject, I don't want to learn from it. It broke. Um, if it's structural, I don't care to deal with it. The bottom three the most important ones and the bottom three start with common failure which is why the apology was created sorry i messed up my bad i'll do better next time and sorry in and of itself is designed like hey i'm sorry i won't do that again which means i have to learn how to not do that again below that's what's called version failure the first version broke this one's not so great but i learned from it to make a better version iphone 11 exists if they made the iphone one and were like oh the camera sucks i'll never make an iphone again we don't get to 11, right? We'd have to figure out a way to make it better from that one. The last one's what's called predictable or predicted failure, which essentially is I'm going to this knowing I'm going to do poorly, but I want to find the holes in the bucket. Like for me, it was sports. We would go out at a coach who I knew every day was going to yell at me. Every day I knew it. But that was my predicted failure. I'm going to go out there and break it so he can yell at me. I can get better. So when it comes to people in life, what we have is a lot of moments that are in the past or coming in the future or we're living in right now that what happens is this moment of failure, we bump it way too high in the order. We filter it in the wrong way. So like, for example, if my business doesn't do well, it could seriously just be the version of failure, but I make, I object, I'm never good at business. I'm gonna get a job, never try it again. Or, you know, my, my wife cheated on me. I'm never gonna be loved again. Never gonna be with another woman again to bump it up there. And what happens is when we live in that way, we never extract the lesson to improve. And so when I look at failures, every one of them, I try to keep below that line. Like even my marriage, for example, like for my marriage, that was a structural failure, but it was a version failure of Anthony. Anthony had to figure out how to be a better husband in that moment in time. And so what happens is I went back in and like found out where he needed to be. And then we actually fixed that structural piece. We got remarried three years later, together four years now. My wife is amazing. Her marriage is crazy amazing. Like I love my life. But that's only because the version of Anthony had to, had to take some insight of what he was messing up and then upgrade that little bit there. Um, or like I go into business now, when I try new things, like perfectionists, they hate the idea of a predicted failure because they don't want any failure. But for me, it's like, I got this thing I want to put into the world. I don't know if it's good enough for the world because I got my brain and I am not my customer. But let me put it out there, knowing I'm going to get negative feedback. So when the negative feedback comes in, I don't have this like ego that gets attacked. I'm like, cool, it broke, it didn't like it. Here's your money back, let me do it better next time. Or okay, cool, how can I fix this? So I'm always looking at like, I know it's gonna go wrong, but when it goes wrong, I bring me to that problem and me is prepared to solve it. I'm dealing with that as it comes along. So for a lot of people in the world listening right now, you need to go back and rehash the things that have put you in a position now where you've stuck yourself in a place where you haven't learned from that and you might unfortunately keep repeating that same process 
because you haven't extracted the information. So iPhone one of you, like your version one, you're stuck in version one. You haven't gone to two because you haven't learned. You said it was abject. Go learn from it, then put version two out, version three, and keep on rolling. Perfect, perfect. Well, that sounds like uh, your family's coming in, so it's time for us yeah. to land the plane. Uh, Mo and I always ask these questions to every single one of our guests here on the Vision Lab podcast. Mo, what you got? Uh, uh, Anthony, it is you at a round table, and there are five other guests. Uh, five other guests. Dead or alive, who are the five people you want at your table? And I one want, of them can't be Jesus. Well, Jesus, he's, he's up in heaven, man. I'll, I'll catch him on the, on the up, up when I get there. Um, let's see. I'm going to say uh, Barack Obama, just because I want to know what it's like to be in that White House. Uh, I want to hang out with Hitler. Not because I like the dude, but I got to figure out how does this man's brain, How's brain tick? tick, man? I don't, not, not even because I just, just literally, I wanna, I'm curious about that part of him. Um, I would like to, uh, Kim Jong-un, that guy's loopy, bro. I want to know what this loopy bird is like. He's, uh, he's amazing. Martin Luther King Jr., because I really want to know what, what he would expect for society at this point in time. Uh, and then me from the future, like future ant. And the only reason I say future Ant is because of all the people in the world that I could ever talk to, I will never fully know anybody's brain. Yours, mine, our filters have too much that's different. But if I am able to talk to future Ant about how he sees the world, I'll know his brain. He could talk to me in a way I'll understand clearly. So I want to know, like, did I do it right? Like, am I in the right direction? Am I rolling where I'm supposed to go? Well, it's funny that you say that. But real quickly, before I ask the last question on the podcast, how can our visionaries get a hold of you um, if they're interested in learning more about Identity Shift? Yeah, just go to anthonytrucks.com or go to at Anthony Trucks on Instagram. And do you have a book coming out? I have a book I'm writing, which will come out if all goes well, like June, July now. I was going to try for May, June, but this whole slowdown is getting hectic. Cool. But it's a yeah, book coming out later. Definitely what? keep us posted on that. One more thing before I come to ask the last question. Shout yeah. out to our sponsors, uh, Edwina and the family over at Blowing Smoke Cigar Lounge in Duncanville, Texas. Uh, the address is 215 West Camp Wisdom Road. Uh, for those of you on the internet uh, trying to find it uh, on Instagram, they're at Blowing Smoke. And uh, the website is uh, BlowingSmokeCigarLounge.com, I do believe. And also shout out to the good guys at Definition Cigars, uh, whether it's the, uh, the prolific, the conception of the brand new, the Equalizer, uh, which they were uh, kind of less taste test a few weeks ago. Uh, you can find them on uh, on Instagram at Definition Cigars or on the internet uh, at DefinitionCigars.com. All right. So as we land this plane, Anthony, again, I want to say big, big thanks to you for hopping into the lab, jumping on yeah. the podcast, and really opening up. So my last question is this to you. What would the – now, you have we have a time clock here in case you didn't know. What mm. would Anthony Trucks today – the version of yourself today, what yep. advice would you be giving yourself from five years ago? Five years ago, uh, study copywriting. <laughs> nice. <laughs> At the end of the day, it's, a, it's one thing in our crazy world to have an idea. It's another thing to be able to plant the idea in somebody else's heart. The only way you can do it is through words. Uh, and so from a distance, I, I wish I would have learned how the structure of words work to be able to really clearly communicate my message and heart to people. Uh, so it's not that it's a bad thing, but I'm learning how to do that more and more now. Copyright is a great way to do it. Okay. Now we're going to move the clock forward five years. What would the older version of Anthony trucks, what advice would he be giving you today? Uh, he would give me the advice of, of be in a season of dad, which is like, I, I have a business that runs well. And, and for me, the most important thing is making sure that in the later years, because my kids will spend more time as adults than they will as kids. In the later years, my kids want to come home for the holidays. They want to come experience time with pops and mom. And so I don't want that to be something where I trump it because I'm like, I'm in this building, strike while the fire's hot. I got to build up. Like I'm, I'm looking at a good tick. Like my kids and I are literally going to go play knockout in the backyard right now. I'm going to stay in the season of dad. And when they go off to school, I'll be... 44 my kids are all gone i'll have ample time to keep building perfect perfect well again thank you very much for taking the time out of your schedule um, to be here on the vision lab podcast um, to all the visionaries that are listening or tuning in guys this man is absolutely incredible make sure that you start to follow him he's got a youtube channel as well all of our guests on the vision lab podcast are dropping nuggets on on these trails so make sure you pick them up Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ryan Mosley. The voice you've been listening to is Anthony Trucks. 
My partner in crime is Ryan Cuffey, and you've been listening to another great episode of the Vision Lab podcast. We will see you next week. Blessings. <laughs>